talking to you about uh, the fourth industrial revolution. In the 18th century, at about 1811, 1816, there were a group of people called the Luddites. Now, these were basically factory workers who came to work every day, did their work, and went back. But they basically found out that their bosses introduced machinery into the factories. Now, these machineries were able to spin threads faster in a more structured way. The machines didn't go tired. The machines were working sun up to sundown. And they told themselves, listen, guys, if we continue this way, our bosses are going to come to us and say, because these machines are that good, let's cut 50% of our staff. And the remaining 50%, let's maybe you walk 8 to 12 instead of 8 to 5, and your um, source of income would reduce. So they took up arms, they were rioting, they were burning things, they were even destroying the machinery as well. Now, this basically began the whole idea of the Industrial Revolution. This was a point whereby people basically were at arms with machines. And the, the whole idea about the Industrial Revolution was basically showing how machinery was able to, pro, to improve production or to improve the way of life of people around the world. Now, we all know basically that uh, between the 18th century and 2020, 2019, in the world today, there are basically four industrial revolutions. And the whole idea is to show you today a path to which we have basically grown and gone far. Now, the first industrial revolution was around the early 18th centuries. Now, this basically talked about, you know, uh, machinery, you know, the steam engine. Now, imagine people with the cart and the horse doing their normal work. And across the street, you had somebody like a Henry Ford who had the three-legged motor or four-legged motor and was walking across and was driving across trying out his new invention. And maybe people within the community were basically saying, who is this funny man with this noisy thing making noise? Please go away. And they not knowing that the motor engine or the steam engine was basically taking the jobs of the guy who owned the cat and the horse. Imagine also the guy who owned the cat and the horse had a big ranch where he basically was breeding more stronger horses to be able to sell. And lo and behold, just behind or beside him, you know, his competition was basically changing life um, like we know it today. The second industrial revolution talks about the light bulb, the invention of the light bulb and electricity, bringing illumination and causing mass production all around the world. The third industrial revolution was the advent of the computer. Right? Being able to crunch numbers faster than we know it. The personal computer, I'm not sure if any of you here remember computers like the Pentium 286, Pentium 386. This was like ages ago, right? So personal computers coming into our lives, helping people who did bookkeeping write down numbers or, let, or letters or whatever it is in long sheets of paper and doing the additions or subtractions, but now a computer was able to do it much more uh, faster. And here we are in the best time to live in the world, the fourth industrial revolution. This is where we hear about blockchain. This is where we hear about machine learning. We hear about artificial intelligence. We hear about robotics. We hear about internet of things. This is where you hear about convergence and networks coming together. This is also the time where you hear people say, I'm going out to get my Uber, as compared to when people said, I'm going out to get a taxi. This is a time where you hear people say, pick me up at my Airbnb, as compared to pick me up at Sheraton or Protea Hotel. This is also a time where people of my age grade, and I'm not that old, but we're more like in a cross between analog and digital. Wouldn't it surprise you that there are some people today who would argue with you if you let them know there was a TV that was in a box and you had to hit and tap and those colored things would come out? Because all they've known today is the flat screen TV. There are some people today who have not been able to dial to basically tune into a radio station. As compared to those days, they would have to dial the shortwave radio to get a good, a good frequency. And even at that, there are people 
right now, who can just choose and select to say, I want only sports. I want only jokes, as compared to back then when it was chronological. You had to start with the news at some point in time and get to the sports part. But now, you just pick and choose. I want only sports, I want only news, and I want sports or jokes at a particular time of the day because it's convenient for you, right? So this is basically what the fourth industrial revolution is about and is doing to us and is changing our world. And it's obviously clear for us to see that our world is fast changing. From technology to agriculture to anything you want to think about. So basically put any product or any scenario on the table and put technology close to it. Technology basically changes and transforms it. These are the days as well where we hear about things like self-driving cars. And it's not just hearing about them. This is real. I've, I have actually entered a Tesla and it drove itself from point A to point B. And I was shit scared, right? Because I normally control my own car, but this was driving me to, the, to, to my point. And you, and you have places in Europe whereby a car or a truck drives from point A to point B and it does what it's supposed to do. These are days where we have the first artificial intelligent lawyer. So imagine those who are in the law field right now. Your jobs are going away. And imagine how it works. So because the people within Europe or those who are abroad have basically curated law cases from the, seven, from the 18th centuries down till now, they basically fed everything into a system. So there's possibly 20 or 15 percent of law cases that you bring to a lawyer now that has never happened before. So you put it into a machine and it basically tells you what to do and it goes from one step down to the other. So our world is basically changing. So imagine you asking Google or Bing a question, just one question, and it gives you at least 10 different pages to one question. So you can imagine how brilliant you can tune your, or you can tune or modify your answers to be as are today. These are the days as well where we have drones in places like Kenya and Rwanda move drug samples or move physical drugs or blood samples from one community to the other. And you can imagine how that basically helps those who are in the um, health uh, industry. And there are lots of stats that basically we see nowadays that basically blow our minds. Two of them here call out to me. As of today, we're basically using less than 1% of the available data in the world today. Let me turn that around for you. Imagine I tell you you're using less than 1% of your car's capacity. Or I tell you you're using less than 1% of your brain capacity. Or I tell you you're using less than 1% of the food in your house. It just tells you that there is more that you can do with 99%. So imagine how much information we have today. Another startling fact is that by 2020, which is about two, three months from now, globally, 75 million jobs are going to be extinct. They're going to be lost, gone. So how many people in this room, well, you guys look all young. Yeah, you're all young. But imagine somebody in this room whose jobs is going to go away. That's a big deal. But while that is scary as well, we have the World Economic Forum that tells us that even though 75 million jobs are going to get lost or go extinct, 133 million jobs are going to be created between 2020 and 2022. So how many people up here can tell me they're one of those people who will get those 133 million jobs? I see everybody raising their hands, and I give you a high five from here. But if you're going to be one of those people who are going to be part of those 133 million jobs globally, then you'd be telling me that you have skills like cognitive flexibility. Who has that? Who even knows what that means? And you raise your hand. You're going to have skills like critical problem solving or critical thinking, right? As compared to the skills that was expected of you as at 2015, it basically tells you that in the fourth industrial revolution, things are changing much more faster and we need to find a way to work our ways towards that. So imagine the 10 emerging jobs that are coming up 
part of those 133 million jobs that I, that I, I mentioned. Jobs like machine learning specialists, jobs like big data specialists. How many people here have trained to do or to be that? And imagine the jobs that are already getting extinct. Data processors, you're gonna be your a clerk, your job is getting extinct. You are an auditor, your job is getting extinct. You are an accounting rep, your job is getting extinct. Because you have solutions today that can do end-to-end -end accounting, that can do end-to-end -end auditing. So if you were a company owner, why would you employ an accountant if a solution can do it end-to-end? -end? And guess how it works? Because as a business, somebody pays money into your account, your account is tied to your bank, and that is also tied to your internal accounting system. Your system already captures information of what was paid, of who paid it and when. And you're paying out salary to somebody, or you're giving a petty cash to somebody, it's captured. At the end of the day, it does the plus and the minus, and there you go. You need zero human intervention. So you can imagine the jobs that are going to be lost because it's no more relevant and because technology has taken, um, has taken that place. So it's important for us to begin to build those essential life skills. And I call them essential life skills because if you don't have those skills, you're not going to have those jobs. Unless if it's going to be the menial jobs that we see in our days. But if you're talking about jobs that are relevant for today, those skills are important. And that's why I term them essential life skills. So from AI to machine learning to bot services to Internet of Things, technology is basically changing and empowering how we live today. Imagine from a communication point of view. We are now much more closer to our family, to our friends, people who you've not seen or met 30 years ago. You can be able to talk to them now through applications like, um, like Facebook or WhatsApp, and they can be basically part of your lives, right? Your parents can basically share in your childbirth. Your parents can, sh can, can share in your gra in their graduation. You can even go through live video and show your mom the soup you're cooking to make sure you're doing it very well, and she can correct you as compared to you driving her or flying her down from the east or wherever she lives to come to your house to show you that. That's the impact of technology. Imagine agriculture. Today, we have <coughs> drones in places like, like Israel that can hover around your farm and can tell you the health status of your plant. Imagine what it used to be 20 or 30 years ago, or maybe what we even do now in Africa. So technology is basically empowering and making it easier for us to move. And in the environment, we basically know that global warming is changing how we live. So technology basically empowers you to get to move and change how you interact. So basically imagine that we had a government. And when I mean government, government in our religious places, government in the home, government in our schools, government in the marketplace, who basically know and understand these statistics that I'm sharing with you. And they basically say, let's have three million people, three million young people within the Southeast who we are going to train to be data scientists, who we are going to be trained to learn artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff. Imagine what that would do and how that would change the face of a Bakeliki, how that would change the face of the Southeast. Imagine if this same government as well says that broadband internet access is a fundamental human right. Because stats have shown us, basically, that the more internet connection you have in a locality, the more your GDP goes up. And let me explain it to you. So because the girl in the village has internet connection, she might be the kind of person who cracks jokes, makes everybody laugh, and she has 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 uh, followers. Then she'd get, she gets contacted by maybe a Nestle or a big brand to say, we have a new product, help us, um, help us uh, advertise this new product. And when she does that, she, get paid, she, she gets paid for it, only because, if you walk your steps backwards, there was internet connection available for her to be able to reach a broad set of people she couldn't reach before. Imagine if we had, if your doctors basically had the right health data information about you today. And they had the history from where you were, from when you were born and from every single time you have come to the hospital. They've captured your data and captured whatever it is was wrong with you. And imagine you had an ailment that they couldn't figure out 
and there was connectivity and they can connect to different hospitals or different research centers around the world. And, you could, and they can say, okay, we can find out that there are probably 40 or 50 people like this globally who have this challenge or this ailment. And we can now go to the drug manufacturers and tell them, please manufacture this variant or this level of drug for XYZ person because we have the data and the information. So the question before I leave you guys today is, are we ready? We're not ready. No. Because we don't have any of these things. There's nobody in this room, maybe 2% of people in this room, who have those skills I mentioned here. And I say that because I'm in the field of technology and I see young people every day. I'd be surprised if 2% of people in this room have any of those skills that are there or have ready for the jobs that I even have that I need to fill up right now. It's hard to find those skills. So we're not ready. We're not ready as a country. We're not ready as a people. We're not ready even as a Southeast. They say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. So maybe I should have been here 1990 talking about this now to be able to inspire everybody to say this is what is going on and this is where we need to change. But regardless of the fact that we didn't do that and the whole idea of digital transformation is to say if you put anything right close to technology, technology basically transforms it to make life easy for everybody. And in doing a summary, we basically, for the industrial revolutions, we went from the steam engine we went to the advent of technology, well, advent of, sorry, of the, of the light bulb and technology, and here we are in the digital world. So I hope that with this short time I've spent with you guys, I've been able to at least sow or plant that seed that would generate that tree that we need to. And my hope is that we're able to make a difference in Abakaliki, we're able to make a difference in the Southeast, we're able to make a difference in Africa as a whole because this is our time. So the last charge I would like to leave you guys with is let's begin now, because today is here for us. Thank you very much.